few of you out there. Thanks for joining us, everyone. All right, so hello, everyone. My name's Rachel Hocking. Welcome to this very necessary discussion with the Partnership for Justice in Health. And I'm going to introduce what we're going to have a yarn about in just a moment. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the unceded lands of Gadigal. I acknowledge their sovereignty and thank Gadigal elders and ancestors for being really generous hosts on their country, especially to me for the last six years. I've called this place home. I've also worked here, so I'm feeling very grateful to be here again for this discussion. I also acknowledge all the mob in the discussion today, including your elders and any further across the country. Today, I want to make a special mention in light of everything that's going on in the world right now. Um, I'd like to voice my public solidarity with our P Palestinian brothers and sisters. As a Walpuri woman from the Northern Territory, I stand with you, I hear you, and I'm here to share your voices where and when I can. So as mentioned, my name is Rachel Hocking. A few of you might know me as a former NITV reporter. I'm no longer there, I'm now a freelancer, which means I get to have yarns like this and facilitate discussions about important topics. So I'm really honoured to be here today to launch the Partnership for Justice in Health. The discussion paper is also going to be part of this launch. It was uh, written by Associate Professor Dr. Chelsea Wadigo, Dr. David Singh and Dr. Alyssa McCown. It's called Race, Racism and the Australian Health System. For those watching, watching this webinar is going to discuss deceased persons and topics which can be traumatic to listen to, so please take care while watching. We're going to have information at the end of the presentation about how you can seek culturally appropriate support through Aborig Aboriginal medical services. In 2017, the death of Wiradjuri woman Naomi Williams and her unborn child at Tumut Hospital in New South Wales highlighted how racism in the Australian health system harms Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. This injustice also took place in the deaths of Yamachi woman Miss Dew and Yorta Yorta woman Auntie Tanya Day, where medical and judicial neglect contributed directly to their passing. 30 years on from the handing down of the Royal Commission into Black Deaths in Custody, we know that inadequate medical care continues to be a major component of the high rate of deaths in custody of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. For Justice in Health has come together to examine the Australian government's commitment to a health system free of racism. Pretty big goal. And to look at what action this commitment requires within the intersection of the health and justice systems. Today, we're here to speak with members of the partnership about their work together and the discussion paper, which I mentioned earlier. Also want to make a quick mention of the incredible artwork that's been commissioned for the paper. You might be able to catch a glimpse on some of the slides that we have throughout the presentation. It's by Nut and Jetty artist Jordan Lovegrove, and it's a beautiful story. Later in the discussion, we'll also hear from April Day, who's a family member who's been directly affected by deaths in custody and now a staunch advocate for ending this injustice. She'll join me on a Q&A panel with Chelsea and George Newhouse. And to begin, we're going to hear from a couple of people. Carl Briscoe, who's co-chair of the Partnership for Justice and Health and the CEO of the National Association of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Workers and Practitioners. Carl is a proud Kuku Yalanji man from Mossman, Daintree area of far north Queensland, and has worked for over 18 years in the health sector. We'll then be joined by Janine Mohammed, also co-chair of the Partnership for Justice and Health and CEO of the Lowitcher Institute. Janine is a proud Narunga Ghana woman from South Australia. Over the past 20 years, Janine has worked in nursing, management, project management and workforce and health policy in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health sector. Following Janine and Carl, we'll then hear from Associate Professor Dr Chelsea Wadigo, who will discuss the formation of the paper and its recommendations. Chelsea is a Munanjali and South Sea Islander woman, a Principal Research Fellow at the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies Unit at the University of Queensland. And Chelsea is working within Indigenous health as a health worker and health researcher. Her work has drawn attention to the role of race in the production of health inequalities. It's a big mouthful of introductions there for you. It's uh, time to hear from Carl and Janine. 
Thank you, Rachel, and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. So as Rachel said, I'm a Googie Allenji man from the Mossman Daintree area in far north Queensland and the co-chair of the Partnership for Justice Health and the CEO of the National Association of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Workers and Health Practitioners. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal peoples, where I'm coming from today with this video conference and pay my respects to elders past, present and to the generations of emerging elders yet to come. So significant work to eliminate racism has progressed by a number of campaigns and organisations over the many years. We recognise and thank you for the efforts and looking forward to collaborating in the future. So who are we? So the Partnership for Justice Health is an alliance of self-determining Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander academics, legal experts, and national peak health and justice organisations. Our founding members include ABSTAR Consulting, the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association, the Congress of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Nurses and Midwives, Indigenous Allied Health Australia, the Institute for Collaborative Research, uh, Race Research, the Lewitcher Institute, the National Justice Project, and the National Association of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Workers and Practitioners. Together, we are seeking to ensure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples experience health and well-being through a prism of cultural dig culture, dignity, and justice. Why did we form? So we formed in early 17 in response to the death of a, of the, of a Wiradjuri woman, uh, Naomi Williams, and her unborn child at Chermont Hospital in New South Wales. Since this time, we have worked together to build shared understanding of race and racism, how these con constructs function, and the harmful impacts they cause. As leaders operating at the interface of health and justice systems, we have seen too many lives unnecessarily cut short or diminished as a result of racism and consider that Australian health and justice systems are failing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Jointly, we recognise justice systems cannot effectively be the mechanism used to redress racism in the health system while, we, while it neglects to address racism within, within its own practices. By combining our efforts, we are aiming to in, initiate a cultural shift and influence the implementation of system-focused efforts to identify and eliminate racism and embed cultural safety across the health and justice systems. In moving forward, we recognise that the burden does not lie with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to have the confidence, but both the justice and health systems will protect and defend accordingly. It lies with both systems demonstrating a commitment to eliminating racism through the reform of practices and policies in all areas of operation. We urge leaders and champions from across all levels and domains of both the health and justice systems to reflect on their roles and consider what they can do to inform, influence and empower change. Privileging our community's voices. 30 years after the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, we stand in solidarity with the grieving families and communities of loved ones who have died in custody due to the failure of government and organisations to effectively respond. Today, they are felt, <coughs> sorry, to this day, they are yet to find justice. Recommendations and actions from the Royal Commission and numerous other reports and inquiries lay dormant and the harmful and destructive impacts of racism on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health and well-being endures. Immediate and vast societal change is required. 
We therefore ask all Australians to listen to the voices of these families and reflect on the trauma and harm that continues to reverberate across our communities. The story of each life lost and the story of colonial violence entrenched within the fabric of our health, education, legal and justice systems demonstrates time and time again that the systems designed to care and protect a failing First Nations people. Our people's lives must not be reduced to statistics listening to the voices of these families and reflecting on the powerful stories they tell has a potential to inspire widespread change. These lived experiences are central to understanding how racism operates and going forward, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people must be involved in leading all efforts to eliminate it. The leadership shown by grieving families and activists who grounded their demonstrations and the sh sharing of their stories in truth must be reflected in the national policy and operations. We understand many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families and people have stories to tell and over the coming months we will be working together and amplify their stories and voices our role and what we will do. So all members of the Partnership for Justice in Health are committed to eliminating the impacts of racism on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across individual, institutional and systemic levels of healthcare and the justice systems. We are all positioned to work alongside other organisations and campaigns to create the political will necessary for considered comprehensive long-term action. Collectively, we have lived experiences, a comprehensive understanding of the interaction and impact of race and racism across the health and justice systems. Professional expertise in redress, cultural safety, shared decision-making and determination. Influence, connections and extensive networks across Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia and governments and a demonstrated track record in cross-sectorial collaboration and delivering services in partnerships. Going forward, we will be working to embed truth-telling as a guiding principle in the operations of Australia's systems and public discourse. Place Abor Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at the centre of driving solutions. Establishing shared understanding so that racism and discrimination are better understood, addressed and prevented. Supporting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to understand their rights, the avenues for redress and to encourage them to report and act against racism and ensure high quality approaches to cultural, safe, cultural safety and responsive practices are embedded across the health and justice systems. So today marks an important step in our partnership journey. We are not only hosting this webinar, but we'll also be launching a website and some initial resources designed to support action. I'd encourage you to join our mailing list, learn more about race and racism, and reflect on how you can help affect change across the health and justice systems. Detailed, detailed about our website will be forwarded to you after this webinar, but there is a screenshot currently up on the screen. Lastly, I'd like to thank all of those who helped the partnership in getting to this point. It has required some incredible efforts and commitment by a small number of staff collaborating across organisations behind the scenes. Thanks must go to our webinar panel. They have all shown significant leadership in striving for justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. April Day in particular continues to demonstrate incredible strength and courage 
after losing her mother in the most unjust of circumstances. April's dedication and leadership has influenced significant change and helped to bring the issue of racism in the health and justice system to the fore. We are incredibly privileged to have her with us today. I'll now pass over to Dr. Janine Muhammad. Janine is also the co-chair of the partnership and the CEO of the Lewitchi Institute. Over to you, Janine. Thank you, Carl. And um, can I start by also thanking you, Rachel, and uh, by acknowledging that too many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's lives are cut short by racism. Um, I also want to begin by acknowledging the people in the country from where everyone is joining us today. I acknowledge, of course, our elders, uh, you know, on whose shoulders we stand um, and acknowledge their patience over many generations. Um, I acknowledge them both past and present um, and our future emerging generations for whom our collective work is so important. Um, and it's often quite beautiful to watch on Twitter, the next generation of strong young Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples and allies rising up against racism. Uh, I am the proud CEO of the Lowitch Institute and I'm very proud to be the co-chair and a founding member uh, of the partnership that's in conversation with us here today. However, it's quite sad that we even had to establish this partnership. I wish we never did have to do that. Um, I'm very excited and proud to be here to launch the Lowitch Institute's latest discussion paper, um, aforementioned Race, Racism and the Australian Health System by Associate Professor Chelsea Watergo, Dr. David Singh and Dr. Alyssa McGowan. Um, a big focus of the Lowitch Institute's work is the analysis of issues affecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as they tell us. Um, we do research, but it's um, not just about research for research's sake. Uh, we seek to translate knowledge into policy programs and of course better health outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And at the core of that, of course, has been advocating for a stronger focus on anti-racism. Um, and that means zero tolerance towards racism um, within the Indigenous health research sector and of course, more broadly. So over our 23 years at the Lowitch Institute, we've invested in several national symposiums and we've commissioned research papers, which you can find on our website uh, to further this critical field of inquiry. Um, and now we have this amazing paper to offer. Uh, thank you, Chelsea and the team, a seminal piece of work um, which you know really speaks to health and justice and that um, and understanding that these are all very much preventable deaths. Um, I urge everyone here today online, and thank you for joining us, um, to read the report. But it's not just about reading and the consumption of reading this paper. It's actually a paper that asks for action. So please, once you've read it, think about how you individually and systemically can put this into action. Um, and every recommendation is important. Um, so. Uh, you know, like many reports before this one, people tend to cherry pick, but what we want to see is the recommendations in their entirety uh, implemented um, and, and be done in full. Um, so Chelsea, I'll hand over to you with thanks to you and your amazing uh, team and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. But before I go, I just do want to acknowledge George as a founding member um, who was very inspirational and tireless in his work. Um, I also, of course, want to acknowledge yourself, Chelsea, um, and I also want to acknowledge, you know, the ongoing um, stories that we as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples, you know, need to tell um, to get, uh, to be heard, you know, in this space. And um, thank you today for being online, um, again, retelling our stories, we, you know, which often means that we're re-traumatised. But um, hopefully, you know, in the near future, we begin to see action change and the eradication of Thanks. Over to you, Chels. I'm Turbo Nyagara Country. 
Um, I want to thank um, the partnership for inviting me into this conversation today. Um, I want to acknowledge the mob um, um, who in life and in death have long testified and theorised to the violence of the Australian health system. Um, and I want to just make sure that what we offer today in terms of a scoping paper is not a, a claiming to know this space, but rather trying to amplify the existing knowledge the existing work of Indigenous peoples um, in not just testifying about racism, but theorising our way out of it. Um, so I just want to acknowledge, acknowledge MOB, um, whose work um, we're able to learn from, build on, and continue to be in conversation with. Um, today, I'm just going to speak for a few minutes just really to talk you through the paper and not necessarily um, cover all the content in it, but give you a sense of what the paper is and its function um, and, and how we hope it gets put to work um, for people who are interested in doing work in this, in this space. Um, I do want to acknowledge um, uh, the amazing work of the co-authors and colleagues, um, Dr David Singh, who is the academic lead of the Indigenous Health Humanities Agenda that um, we've been fortunate to, um, to, um, uh, to be leading um, and through an ARC discovery. Um, and also Dr Lisa McCown, who is at QUT School of Justice, who um, is a valued colleague and a member of that research team, but also in the um, paper's earliest formations had a, a critical role in, in pulling this report together. Um, this definitely is a joint effort um, of, of, of people who I have the uh, good privilege to work with. Um, I also want to acknowledge, um, the thing is, that in, in, in talking about racism and the health system, it's not easy work. It's not like any other health condition that we get to attend to in Indigenous health. It occupies this interesting political space in which there is a whole lot of resistance to it, despite the fact that it has such a major role in the premature deaths of Indigenous peoples. Um, and so um, this is not a matter of gathering the evidence base or having clear definitions of what racism is as a way to solve it. Um, we have to deal with the politics of this work um, including how we're positioned as scholars who are always labelled political, not intellectual. Um, so I want to acknowledge the leadership of Ron Mokak, um, who was the former CEO of Lowitch Institute, who was very interested in how the Institute could attend to this mission intellectually around securing a health system free of racism. I want to acknowledge the leadership of those who worked on that National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan, who got it on the agenda, a vision of a health system free of racism. Blackfellas has been asking for this for a long time, but to get it into a policy document gives a lever for which we can argue for sustained attention to addressing racism. Um, and I know having sat at those tables, getting racism into a conversation isn't an easy one, despite the fact that it's a conversation that Blackfellas are forced to have every day. Um, I want to acknowledge the leadership of Janine of supporting this and the partnership for getting this paper out for, for um, to a broader public so that it could be of use. Um, and also Greg Phillips, Professor Greg Phillips, who had a key role also in the partnership in, in bringing us in um, in the formation of the scoping paper and the meetings around strategising how do we attend to racism and health service, and who also had a very uh, integral role in um, the medical curriculum and getting racism named very early on. Um, this is a struggle to get um, the health system to deal with racism despite the fact that we're dealing with it. And... Um, it, it's not an easy, um, easy place to occupy. So in knowing all of that, what we've done is we've put together a scoping paper that what it seeks to do is help build a community of people who are interested in attending to racism in the health system. Now, I don't, I'm not of, of the camp that I don't believe that the vision of a health system free of racism is possible. I don't believe we can eradicate it, but I do believe that we can always work and strategize to undermine it, um, that it's a fight that we're always gonna be engaged in. And so what we've done in pulling together this, this scoping paper is to look at, the, look at developing a shared understanding of some concepts, like what is racism, what is systemic racism, what institutional racism, and not to sort of try and define racism absolutely as this is the only way to know. We wanna show the various ways of understanding racism, which then informs our strategy and our approach and what knowledges we need in order to attend to it. Um, so this is about, we're not saying there's one fix, there's one way of knowing, or there's, there's, there's um, you know, one scholar who can solve the problem of racism. There needs to be a community of people who are interested in attending to race and racism. And it needs to be a, a combination of 
intellectual and political strategizing at any one time, which constantly needs to be changing. What we know is that black fellows on the streets, black fellows outside coroner's courts are always strategizing and theorizing responses to racism. So what we did, what we tried to do with this paper was to bring together that activism, that theorizing and bring it together and show how we're already working as a community uh, of, of mob, trying to understand this. through the um, uh, document. And I think I'm sh not sharing. So if I can just scroll through what we have um, in terms of the framing of the paper, um, we've got some key terms and concepts that we go through. What we do also is we look at the literature in terms of the various ways of understanding racism, um, acknowledging that there are strengths and limitations to any research around racism, that there's no one absolute way of, of knowing it. Um, and so you'll see that we do have some critiques around different approaches, and it's not to undermine the work, but it's to be honest about the limitations of any particular way of knowing. Um, and using that to inform our strategy. Um, the idea is to bring together people with some shared understanding of concepts. So when we're at the table talking about race and racism, what is the, what, what, how do we understand these concepts? Um, as someone who did, has studied in the health sciences, uh, this wasn't part of my training. I wasn't taught about race and racism or critical race theory um, or how race operates to produce racialized outcomes. That's something that I had to undertake of my own accord as a postgraduate and beyond. So currently we're not teaching students in that, that study the health sciences how to understand race and racism. Um, so this document seeks to at least start to fill that knowledge gap that exists. Um, and so what we've done is we've shown the different ways of understanding racism um, with just some snapshots. It's not ex exhaustive. It's to show some examples of how different research approaches to racism construct different meanings about what racism is. Um, so, you know, um, there are some studies that quantify people's experiences of racism as they, as they experience them, but that may not necessarily capture what uh, institutional racism is, for instance. Um, it may capture parts of a story about race and racism. Um, so we've kind of shown some of those, um, the, you know, leading works that exist that have tried to look at race and racism and the different ways and approaches and how, um, what they can offer us but also the limitations of what they can offer. Um, and so we look at those that seek to quantify racism, those that seek to theorise through testimony. Um, we see that in the more recent times as we've had a growing Indigenous health workforce, we're getting growing testimonies of racism in the health system from Indigenous health professionals. Um, so there is this emergent literature from Blackfellas talking about racism, often at great cost, um, but pre being prepared to testify around what it is and how it's experienced. Um, so we, we try to acknowledge um, that emergent literature as well. Um, so I'll just scroll through here. The second part of the report is really a really interesting um, part because it looks at the political directions. This came out of, okay, we've got a, a vision of a health system free of racism. How do we achieve that? Um, there's no plan in place in terms of the, the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan explicitly around how to attend to race and racism. We also know with the Human Rights Commission, Race Discrimination um, Commissioner released a concepts paper on anti-racism, but didn't clarify the concepts that they were using. So we have these visions, these statements around wanting to get to do away with racism without understanding what it is or a strategy to achieving it. And so this scoping paper seeks to kind of um, canvas some of those gaps within, within the literature and within um, current policies that claim to want to do away with racism. What we've done here is we've looked at different, um, different anti-racist approaches, um, and there are many different anti-racist approaches, and each of them have strengths and each of them have limitations. And so what we've sought to do is give a sense of the different types of anti-racist approaches, how they may work, um, some of the limitations, and we've also tried to bring in examples um, here um, of, of the way in which um, mob here have strategized around race and racism. I think one of the um, uh, 
parts I'm most proud of in this report is, you know, there's the international literature around what they call a radical anti-racism um, that's anti-capitalist. And when we look at those theories, and then when you go to a rally in Mianjin around stopping black deaths in custody, we get to learn from the words of the likes of Ruby Wharton, who's theorising on the run about what to do about racism. And she says it's not about doing performative things within their system, but abolishing it. We can't demand incarceration of police when we are dying of the same system. As long as we walk in love, we'll be able to seek justice. This is not just about the frontline officers, but the bosses who are profiting. And so with each of the examples, we sought to show the way in which black fellows are constantly theorising on the run. And what we're finding is, as the academy um, is failing to keep up. So mob are doing the work, but the, the literature isn't there to capture it um, or to be of service to that work. And so this scoping paper six to kind of, it's a call out um, to the academic intellectual community to go, we need to up our game here in terms of understanding race and racism and being of service to the people who it must be of service to. And that is the grieving families. Um, that is our own mob who every day have to think about race and racism, who can't afford not to talk about it. Um, so we've got some exam a number of examples of different strategies. We've also talked about the, the emerging um, scholarship from Indigenous peoples who are bridging that supposed gap between academic and activists. And that, that really is most black fellows who work in the academy who work in race. And so we've acknowledged the important work of Professor Larissa Brent and Jambana, um, the important work of Alison Whitaker, of Amy Maguire, where you see um, Indigenous academics who are, whose work is not divorced from the struggle that it's born out of. Um, and so with this scoping paper, we seek to bring that together to go, we need to build a community, a community of, of, of mob, wherever we reside, to strategize around race and racism, because it's not just about an evidence base, but one of strategy and um, a, a strategy of building a collective um, that can constantly re-strategize and reformulate ways to attend to race and racism in the health system. So we provided recommendations, and these recommendations aren't recommendations that we're making to mob, but recommend, recommendations that we've made to those that have the resources to help build this intellectual community that is forming uh, irrespective of the, the, the absence of investment. So if we are truly committed to the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan's vision of a health system free of racism, um, if we are really committed to attending to the root cause of health inequality and all these things that we say, then there needs to be a strategic and um, uh, a long-term investment in critical race scholarship that foregrounds Indigenous intellectual sovereignty, that builds a community, not just of academics who build research institutes, but um, building a research community that is of service to Indigenous peoples every day, all the time, um, that can be responsive to, um, and in a way that's not telling mob how to deal with racism, but it's about collecting the evidence needed at any given time to do the work that we need to do to undermine the power of race as it plays out in our lives. And of course, contributes to the death of, of our loved ones. Um, so those recommendations are how do we solve racism? It is um, how do we make a more concerted investment into doing the strategizing around doing the work that needs to be done. And that is an ongoing investment that is required. Um, so there's a call for the NHMRC, for the ARC, um, for the Indigenous MRFF um, to support the leadership that's already been shown by the Lowell Institute as our Indigenous Health Research Institute, um, but the leadership of Indigenous peoples who have been on the streets almost every week this past year, crowdfunding for funerals, standing outside coroner's courts, rallying in city streets, um, mob are doing the work and it's time that that, that work was better supported, better respected um, and um, and recognised not just as life experience, um, recognised not just as testimony, but as a theorising, mob, mob are making a difference. And um, I, I, I guess I'm disappointed that there's not that same commitment, um, that same energy towards undermining racism as there is within the communities that we reside in. And that's it from me. Thank you, Chelsea. I think that was... Um incredibly insightful for a lot of people who might not have had these yarns before. I've been privileged to hear you talk about race and racism and the incredible work of your colleagues um, in the past. And so, yeah, just big thanks again for sharing all of your...
There is going to be information on how to read the presentation paper at the very end of this presentation. So if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, we'll give that information to you. Make sure you take the time to read it if it's something you're interested in. It's time for our panel discussion now. Before we get into it, I'm going to let two of our panellists give a quick introduction to themselves because Chelsea's just had a yarn with you and she's one of our panellists. So first up, we've got Yogi Wada, and then April Day, founder of the Dalio Foundation. And then after April, we'll have George Newhouse, who's the founder and CEO of the National Justice Project. April, take it away, sis. April Day. I am the daughter of Tanya Day who died in police custody. Um, so um, I guess that is, you know, leading me here today, having that lived experience, but as well as being able to turn that into um, what it means for the future of our mob. Um, so you know, it's exactly why I started the Dajua Foundation. So I'm just, you know, really grateful to be here today and have have a yarn with everyone. Yep. Hi, I'm George. New Can you hear me? I'm George Newhouse. I'm a CEO of the National Justice Project. We worked for three long years with um, Sharon Williams, the mother of Naomi Williams, to um, get a New South Wales coroner to acknowledge that prejudice had played a role in Naomi's death. Um, it was an, an extremely profound case and I want to honour Sharon for allowing us to be with her on that journey and to share her story and to drive forward this initiative today and also pay my respects, April, to your family and your mother. You, you have gone through the trauma of a loss and uh, we're, we're here now today to make sure that in any way possible it will never happen again and we need to stamp out racism in healthcare, policing, and all the arms of the state. So we're going to ask a question. see or hear anything. Me neither. I can see and hear everyone, just not on the main stage. Yeah, likewise, April. Hello, can you mob hear me? Yes, yes, can you hear us? I've got no sound on anybody else now. What about us? Hello. Give a thumbs up if you can hear me. Hey, I can see Charles there. All right. I'm assuming that you have introduced yourselves. Unfortunately, my system has just collapsed here and I can't actually um, hear anything. I can see you though. So what I'll do is I'll just introduce the next bit for Chelsea to give a yarn on the first question. And um, then I'll try and get thumbs up from you to introduce the next bits if that works okay. All good, Chels? All right, Deadly. Um, so as you mentioned before, you're scoping... Oh, I'm starting to get a bit of noise back. That's good. Um, you're scoping, scoping paper platforms the voices of activists of um, activists like Gomeroy woman Ruby Wharton, who you just spoke about. Or have families advocating for change in our communities for a long time now. Ruby in particular advocates for abolition as one of the only ways to stop black deaths in custody. Why is it important to uphold the work of our frontline activists in ways of knowing and understanding race and racism, especially in the academy? It's, it's I mean, multiple reasons. Um, at one level, there's this, this is weird contradiction. And uh, for, for me, who's trained as a health researcher, where evidence-based approach is like, you know, you hear it all the time. Yet when it comes to race and racism, for some reason, we just abandon that logic of evidence base um, and including even attending to race and racism. Um, so the, there's multiple reasons why we should be listening to mob in that, uh, firstly, mob are telling the truth about race and racism. Most courageous people when it comes to racism and racism is blackfellas. 
Um, and not because we want to be controversial or political or radical, it's just we have to be because it's, it's, it has a real impact upon our lives. As I don't know how many times we have to say it and how many different ways we have to prove it. Um, so it's, you know, this born out of this frustration that we have people working in health refusing to attend to the thing that is, 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 is affecting Indigenous peoples. And, and we talk about deaths, but we're also talking about people getting diabetes in their 30s. We're talking about all aspects of health. Um, um, you know, and so um, one of the things that I guess frustrates me in the conversation, even around deaths in custody, is the health system who claims to want a system free of racism often gets a free pass when it comes to the state sanctioned violence. And, you know, mob fight for that footage to be released of how the paramedics treat our family members to show that the violence is not just at the hands of the police or prison guards. We're talking about doctors and nurses. We're talking about a system that disproportionately um, disadvantages Indigenous peoples all the time from the resourcing of the community controlled sector, which emerged out of experiences of racism of mob who moved to the cities looking for health care. Racism has been a core feature of the health system. And yet here we're still at the margins trying to get attention to a, a dealing with racism. And I think that's the important work of, of a health justice agenda is it no longer appeals to the health system to treat us better. It demands that the health system treat us better. And so mob are having to, to, to um, uh, use legal means to hold the system accountable for its neglect, for its violence and for its abuse. And I think that's why the work of the National Justice Project um, and this partnership is so very important because um, they're refusing to hear us, whether it's the you know, sophisticated theorising, whether it's the evidence base of quantifying or the, the testimonies of brutality outside coroner's courts, they're not listening. Um, and what we know about power is it's not readily readily seated that we have to compel change. And so this is where the intellectual work can be put to work in helping and form a political strategy to compel change. Um, and, and so this kind of work um, requires a particular kind of people willing to do that work, willing to be unliked, willing to be despised, willing to be demonised, willing to be discredited. Um, uh, but this is the work that our communities have called us to do and this is the work that our communities are doing. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully um, this is one step towards helping build the community that's needed to stand in solidarity with families in a proper way, in an everyday kind of way. Thank you, Chelsea. I mean, we've seen some of that community work action recently. April, you and your family fought so tirelessly to abolish public drunkenness laws in Victoria and you were successful in doing Uh, an enormous amount of energy would have been incredibly taxing. I've seen firsthand, you know, the impact on you and the community. But you did it for something greater than yourselves. And I think there's um, so much appreciation for the incredible advocacy you continue to do while mourning your mother, Auntie Tanya Day. I, I just wanted to ask, I mean, after you launched Dajua Foundation a month ago, which was such a beautiful moment for the community to come together with grief and a sense of healing to look at ways that we can make the system better for everybody. Um, what sorts of things do you get from that community? How important is that community to you in the work that you'll continue to do with Dajua? How do they inform everything from your board structure to the grassroots activism that you've already started doing? Mm. And um, I was actually just thinking about the launch today and it wasn't even necessarily about coming into this but it was just like a moment of thinking that everybody that attended that launch was witnessing a part of our journey that we have embarked on. You know, they're hearing the stories of what happened to our loved ones in custody, but they're hearing the aftermath of it. Um, they're seeing us and witnessing us share that moment together and meet one another for the first time. They're seeing us there with our babies. Um, and then they're also getting to witness the joy of us you know, being with one another and being around our community. So um, it was a really special moment and it was really powerful and it's, it's important because um, that right there is, you know, the whole essence and purpose of the Dajwa Foundation is that it is, you know, upheld with, you know, support and love and solidarity um, and, you know, it's a culturally safe space for our mob um, that they know that if they need that, 
help and that assistance, they can come there and get it. You know, we um, ensure that um, it is, you know, set up with a strategic and coordinated approach where our mob don't need to be, you know, jumping through hoops to get that assistance. Uh, it's not like, you know, another non-Indigenous organisation where you need to fill out, you know, the longest form and explain your trauma just to be able to get that help. And, you know, that's that's what we did with mum. You know, we didn't um, we didn't need to be begging our community for that help and support. They were with us every step of the way. And um, I truly believe that having the community behind us in the way that we strategically planned our campaign is what led us to the abolition of public drunkenness. Um, that is also to acknowledge the leaders and elders that had come before us who had paved the way. It was just by the time that it had reached um, that law, you know, taking our mum away from us, we then stepped into it and able to link it to things like, you know, the recommendation being 30 years overdue and Uncle Harrison Day, able to link it to, you know, mum being arrested for public drunkenness and then immediately after, you know, a white woman was picked up for the same thing, but she wasn't fined and she was driven home. So being able to show that racial injustice, um, to, to really show how dangerous it is within within um, police and the healthcare system because public drunkenness is a health issue um, and it's not a police one. So taking all those things that I have experienced, but also what I have learned has then led me to establishing the Dajua Foundation because we as family members take that teachings and then we try and help other family members be able to do that with their own campaigns so it can one support them but also help them um, achieve some systemic change and it, you know it is very difficult because you know they don't want to hear us but they will know our family's loved one's name. No, we're not just another statistic. You will remember their name and you will remember that they were more than what happened to them and that they they were a loved one. So, you know, we've got myself, um, uh, Michaela Reynolds, who is Nathan Reynolds' uh, sister, Troy Brady's, Ani Sherry, Tilbury Fisher's nephew, uh, Michael, uh, sorry, Samara Fernandez, is Kumanjaya Walker's cousin, and Ani Carolyn Lewis, who has lost multiple family members in custody. And together, you know, we are there to ensure that our organisation stays completely grassroots and it's on a national level and it's away from government funding and influence. So, you know, it's solely relying on donations in the philanthropy sector, which is really important that things like this come up where I can yarn about it to get the word out there. And, you know, our hope is that in the future that there's actually no need for Dajwa because our loved ones aren't continuously dying in custody and that our loved ones and all their family members get that justice that they deserve. We lost her. Maybe she's running for the next question. Thank you for, for um, sh sharing that. Um, you know, one of the things when I'm um, looking at um, Mum, the coroner's report, um, and this is what, you know, got us thinking is um, the coroner in a while was, it's the first time systemic racism was looked at, sought to avoid a, a finding around systemic racism in multiple ways, from not adhering to policy and procedure to also um, um, not making any association with statistical, um, you know, uh, differences in terms of Indigenous experience. So we just saw the, the even though systemic racism was on the table, the way in which the coroner sort of, flouted that in all kinds of ways, yet um, through your action and, and community action, um, there was a response that attended to systemic racism in spite of the coroner's indifference to finding it. And, and, and that just speaks to the power of what of, of, of a black anti-racism that comes from this place, that comes from black fellas, um, that no matter what they say, um, there is there is power in, in, in our own strategizing around that. And, and so, um, you know, thank you for for what you what you're doing, um, and and what we can learn from that. And um, yeah.
shouldn't be investigating police and why there should not be a partnership between coroners and police investigators because you could see the how they treated mum you can see that it was racially motivated except she just danced around it she refused to actually make a recommendation around it and to me that just goes to show well you're scared you don't want to be calling out the people that you've actually put in power to be able to investigate our loved one's death and who completely flawed it as inadequate so she found racial bias in the v-line conductor but then wouldn't in the police when you, we've shown you a perfect moment of how our mum died in custody and was left on a concrete floor to die and you ignored her for hours but then a white woman 10 minutes later you've driven her home safely without a fine that right there is the biggest tell that you could receive thanks for that sis thanks for um on to the conversation well i dropped out We had portal that I've never been in before, but um, I could hear what you were saying through speaker. Um, I had called Sister Bannock, and um, yeah, again, just want to say thanks to April and Chelsea for sharing so much of what your experience has been, especially you, April. I've seen you fight on the front line for so long, and um, it's incredible what you continue to do for community. I'll bring George into the discussion now before we wrap up. Um, you were the legal representative of the Williams family, Wiradjuri woman Naomi Williams, who um, experienced racial discrimination from Tumut Hospital. I wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit about the findings of the coronial inquest. Obviously, you can't go into the whole thing, but just um, sort of what has occurred in the New South Wales health system as a response to this coronial inquiry. Yeah. I just want to uh, follow on from uh, April. Um, the system, our legal system and the coronial system is uh, a, a colonial legal system. Uh, and, it, and I totally agree with April that having police investigating health services and police action and even prisons and guards is totally inappropriate and does not engender trust or drive forward reforms. Um, we were fortunate in Naomi's case um, that we did have a coroner who was prepared to call the conduct of the health service prejudicial, biased, racist. And um, I think that was quite a profound finding. As a result, there were a number of very um, important recommendations about um, uh, adopting targets for employment of Aboriginal healthcare professionals, strengthening the Aboriginal health liaison worker program, auditing implicit bias and racism in um, the system and recording statistics. We talked before about, uh, you know, people were talking before about the system um, not acknowledging racism. It actually hides statistics that would identify racism and instead prefers to highlight statistics that blame, in inverted commas, the victim. It blames uh, mob rather than the system. It never focuses on its own weaknesses and faults um, uh, the other recommendations included identifying and using assessment tools to measure implicit bias, targets for proportional representation on health boards, meaningful consultation with local and key Aboriginal health groups, and investigating strategies that are used successfully in other areas to develop culturally appropriate care. Now, the family have uh, been fighting for the New South Wales health service to accept these recommendations and roll them out statewide. They met with the New South Wales Health Minister and he did agree to um, uh, take up all the recommendations. Now COVID has since intervened and we haven't yet seen the results of, the, of that promise. So, but the family have taken some comfort, but they don't believe it until they see it in the recommendations being implemented by the New South Wales Health Service. And if they're successful, perhaps nationwide. Thank you. Thanks for that, George. Nationwide, gee, that would be something if they actually followed through on that. Um, appreciate your work you do with community. So I just want to acknowledge um, a lot of the work that you do with a lot of other families across the country as well. Um, we're gonna have to wrap up shortly and I feel like we still got so much to unpack, but. 
got a big one for you, Chelsea. I mean, you talk about this resistance to getting racism on the agenda. We resist that resistance, especially when it comes to shifting away from the current ways people have been talking about race and racism or not talking about race and racism at the health and justice intersection. Uh, look, I think, um, I guess what drives me and what inspires me is um, the acts and actions of black fellows. Um, you know, we talk about a, an anti-racism that foregrounds Indigenous sovereignty. Um, so it's remembering who we are, where we come from, and standing our ground. Um, uh, mob, mob, mob are fighting all the time to be heard. Um, and I feel like we have a responsibility um, those of us who have access to certain things, who get to certain tables, who get trusted as experts, we have a responsibility to tell the truth about what's what's happening. Um, um, you know, I, um, I, I've paid a big price for the kind of work I do, which people who work with me know that price. Those who don't, don't see the cost that comes with doing this kind of work. Um, but it's because the work is worth it, because the people who it's of service to is worth it, because we as black fellas are deserving of better. And so this is the thing with racism is we have to attend to the racialized imaginings in our own mind first and accept, accept the idea that we deserve better in our own country, that we are entitled to be cared for, that we are entitled to, to have health services, that we're entitled to housing, that we're entitled to walk these streets without being harassed by police that we're entitled to a lift home if we fall asleep on a train. Like we deserve all of these things because we're human too. And so if we start from the basis that we believe that we're worth fighting for, then we don't have to worry about navigating resistance because we are driven by a commitment to knowing that we are deserving of better in this place. Um, and, I, and, and that's the thing that I think that really um, um, saddens me, those that, that say, let's not talk about racism. Or let's not bring the academic who talks about racism to this table because it's too political. Um, I, I don't know how people like that do that kind of work. Um, you know, like that's, 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 the, that's the sad thing in this moment that still we have people who insist that we shouldn't be talking about racism. You know, how do you face families? Um, uh, so to me, and, and that's been my frustration, and as someone who's like trained in Indigenous public health, undergrad, postgrad, uh, you know, I've been a, 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 you know, a health researcher. I'm, I'm so um, disappointed um, in the Indigenous health research space around the silence when it comes to race and racism. Um, like we're actually being charged with the responsibility to understand what is driving racialized health inequalities. How do you do that if you don't attend to race? And it doesn't matter what condition you're doing, what condition, what body part, what illness, what behaviour, race needs to be at the forefront. And that's why we call among the recommendations that any NHMRC investment in Indigenous health research must answer a question. How does it attend to race? Because at the moment what we're seeing is health research producing racialized knowledge that says that somehow we're complicit in our premature death, that we're not compliant, that if we just behaved better, we'd live longer. And this is the problem with the individual health behaviourist approach in Indigenous health. This is inherently racist. Closing the gap itself is inherently racist. Um, and so we have an obligation to be honest about how racist this whole system is um, and reject the idea that black fellas are to blame for, for our own deaths. The coroners keep finding those in their findings. They keep saying natural causes, natural causes, even though they find the evidence that suggests that the care was insufficient. We look at what happened to Nathan Reynolds. That wasn't natural causes, but yet they keep finding that. And what we have a responsibility as black fellows who work in Indigenous health is not to not to not to provide an evidence base to alibi the state for its violence. Thank you, Chelsea. We're fastly wrapping up now, so I'm just going to um, speak to something that uh, you, April, told me at the launch of the Dajua Foundation. Um, I asked you what the vision of the foundation was going to be in about five to ten years' time, and you and every single board member I spoke to, all families of people who've died in custody, said that the goal was to not exist anymore, to make yourselves obsolete. And I just think it's so incredible that you're fighting for that and that we have a community such as the people who have joined us in this discussion today who are fighting for that. 
So just want to say again how honoured I am to be here to facilitate this discussion. Even though I popped out for a bit, you didn't need So thanks to our speakers. Um, thank you to Lawitcher for facilitating this, um, this partnership. It really is a necessary step in us coming together to share resources and understanding of fighting racism in health and justice systems. Um, as Carl said earlier, this launch is going to assist us to learn more about race and racism, to fill in the gaps in our own knowledge and hopefully affect change across health and justice systems. And what we've heard today in the work of the Dajua Foundation are already achieving um, incredible, incredible goals in this area. So I um, just want to reiterate that if you haven't read the paper, you can get it on the Lowitcher website. Uh, if you haven't heard of the Dajua Foundation, you can go and look them up and you can donate to them to help continue the important work that they do. You're going to get an email when the Partnership for Justice and Health website is launched in a few days. We were hoping it would launch today, but we've still got a couple of days up our sleeves. So when it is launched, you'll get an email and then sign up to a mailing list, which will keep you up to date on all of this important work. And you can check out that scoping paper. Um, if you found any of this discussion difficult, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is help. Make sure you seek culturally appropriate support at your local Aboriginal medical service or reach out to people you trust in your community. Thank you again, everyone, for this important discussion. Thank you.